Hello again. Wrought in iron above the gates of Dachau, the first concentration camp in Nazi Germany, were the words Arbeit macht frei. In German, this means literally, work makes free. The implication is that work will bring as its reward freedom. This same slogan was placed over the entrance to Auschwitz and it has been widely assumed that this was a fiendish black joke on the part of the SS in that they knew very well that there was not the slightest possibility of any of the slave labourers in the camps being made free by their work. In fact, it's altogether possible that rather than being placed there cynically as a taunt to the prisoners, this phrase was used quite honestly by those who set up the camps and that it expressed some mystical reverence for the idea of physical work. The expression Arbeit macht frei was not dreamed up by the Nazis, but was actually a slogan of the Weimar Republic, which preceded the Third Reich. Even they didn't invent the wording, which is the title of a German novel published in 1873. The book by Lorenz Diffenbach tells of the redemption of a group of dissolute gamblers by honest hard work. This concept, that there is something virtuous and liberating about physical work for its own sake, was common in the middle of the 20th century and lingers on to this day. Unemployment is even now seen sometimes as undesirable, not simply because it reduces men to poverty, but because the enforced idleness which goes hand in hand with unemployment is viewed as a moral evil which saps the vitality and worth of those without jobs, leading them on a downward path which is likely to end in apathy and vice. From this perspective, being without work is bad in itself and society should do all it can to remedy the state of affairs. If concentration camps are inextricably linked to the average person's mind with Nazi Germany, then labour camps are automatically associated with Soviet Russia. This reflex connection of different kinds of camps with particular countries has only emerged since the end of the Second World War. The term labour camp had few negative connotations during the 1930s and was widely used both in Parliament and the press. The British camps of that period will accordingly be referred to here as labour camps, which is what they indubitably were. Few readers will be familiar with the image, unfamiliar I should say, with the image of poor starved Oliver Twist in the workhouse saying, please sir, I want some more. The institution of the workhouse is understood by everybody today to have been a bad one. We rightly believe such places to have been little better than prisons. This is of course perfectly true, but we should also bear in mind that in theory they were, unlike prisons, completely voluntary establishments. Nobody was confined in the workhouse and the inmates were free to leave at any time. Nevertheless, hardly anybody ever walked out for the same reason that those in the British labour camps of the 1930s did not in general leave. Surprisingly, workhouses were not officially abolished until the passing of the 1929 Local Government Act, which came into force on the 1st of April 1930. Even then, some workhouses were renamed public assistance institutions and continued operating for another decade. As late as 1939, the year that the Second World War began, there were still 100,000 people, including over 5,000 children in such establishments. At about the same time that the workhouses were being abolished, a Labour government led by Ramsay MacDonald was getting to grips with the effects of the Great Depression. This gloomy period of economic stagnation gripped the world from 1930 until roughly the end of World War II. In some parts of Britain, unemployment rose to shocking levels. 30% of workers in Glasgow were out of work at the height of the Depression. This was roughly the figure for South Wales as a whole. Unemployment was worst in industrial and mining areas, South Wales, the north of England and other such places. In some parts of the country, almost every man was out of work. The unemployment rate in the Welsh town of Taft's Well was 82%. In the south of Britain, things were much better and agriculture was experiencing a boom during the 1930s. Factories such as those manufacturing motor cars were also booming, in stark contrast to the shipyards of the north of England. 
if only some of those unemployed miners and factory workers could be persuaded to move away from the so-called distressed areas and go where there were jobs to be found in the rural economy and factories of southeast England, it was thought by those in government that much of the suffering could be alleviated. In the aftermath of the Wall Street crash, it was thought that some of Britain's difficulties could be overcome if all those people standing idly on the street corners of Manchester, Glasgow and various Welsh mining towns could somehow be transported to farms and given jobs as agricultural labourers. The problem was, of course, that they stubbornly insisted on remaining where they were and didn't have any desire at all to leave the districts where they'd grown up and where all their family and friends were living. They would need to be given a nudge. When Ramsay MacDonald formed a minority Labour government in the summer of 1929, he appointed the first ever woman to the cabinet. Margaret Bondfield was 56 and had previously been a junior minister in MacDonald's 1924 administration. Now she was given the post of Minister of Labour. At that time, unemployment was already a serious problem. Over a million people were either on the dole or claiming unemployment benefit. The previous Conservative government, under Stanley Baldwin, had tinkered with the problem of long-term unemployment, which afflicted certain areas, but without any noticeable result. Now the new Minister for Labour was determined to tackle the scourge head-on. Under the Conservatives, a number of centres have been set up to retrain men and equip them with the skills which might enable them to be more attractive to potential employers. Those who were claiming the dole were invited to attend these institutions. There was a marked reluctance among the unemployed to travel miles to stay in residential centres, as this, as this would mean leaving their friends and family behind. Margaret Bonfield had no patience for pussyfooting around the question, and she told the Cabinet on 23rd of December 1929 that she wished to remove any choice in the matter and compel men to go and live in what were now termed transfer instructional centres. She said at the Cabinet meeting that day that she was most concerned about men who were unlikely to obtain work without a course of reconditioning and referred bitterly to those who refer, refused to avail themselves of the offer of training. There sounds something a little sinister about the idea of reconditioning men, but Bondfield was not the only person in the Ministry of Labour who was using the expression. A year earlier, F.G. Bowers, a civil servant in the Ministry of Labour, had prepared a memo in which he talked of unemployed men who had gone soft and of the need for them to be hardened at special centres. What were the transfer instructional centres, later called simply instructional centres? To all intents and purposes, they were labour camps where soft men would be reconditioned or hardened. This process would be accomplished by means of rough living for a few months, during which men would spend their days engaged in the heaviest kind of physical labour, digging ditches, breaking stones, felling trees and sawing timber. The camps were all in remote, out-of-the-way places, and the intention was that after they had been reconditioned, it might be possible for the men to obtain work of this sort on the land far from the areas of high unemployment from which they came. Accommodation in the camps was basic, similar perhaps to that provided in army barracks. The food was adequate and filling, and the men sent there lived a life in many ways like that of soldiers. They were issued with heavy work clothes and cutlery and lived in wooden huts. The compulsion used to get men to agree to leave their homes and live under fairly harsh conditions of this sort was simple, but they were devastatingly effective. Those who refused to take up a place at the camp to which they had been allocated would no longer be entitled to any unemployment benefit or dole. For men with families, this was a most potent means of persuasion, involving, as it did, the threat of hardship and even starvation for their wives and children. The Dachau concentration camp in Germany, by the way, was roughly similar to the labour camps in Britain. To begin with, Dachau certainly uh, wasn't a place where people were killed. It was a place where men went to live for a while in fairly uh, rigorous conditions. And the idea was that after a spell in the camp at Dachau, they would um, 
be able to pull themselves together and get jobs. From 1930 onward, Ramsey MacDonald's government was doing everything possible to balance the budget. Exports were falling and unemployment rising steeply. It was thought that the only way to restore international confidence in the pound was to make savage cuts in public expenditure. For Ramsey MacDonald's administration, the financial crisis was infinitely worse than anything which has been faced by any British government, either before or since. Since unemployment benefits were soaring, the national government hit firstly upon the idea of slashing all payments by 10%, and then taking steps to see if they couldn't avoid paying out money altogether to some families. This was the hated means test. Those who had paid enough contributions under the Insurance Act were entitled to claim six months' unemployment benefit, and these payments were unconditional. If a person was still un unemployed after six months, then the 1921 Insurance Act provided for what was called uncovenanted benefit, and these payments were made very grudgingly. They were doled out. That's why we call it the dole today, or why older people refer to uh, national assistance payments as a dole. At first it was distributed by the local public assistance committees but then the National Assistance Board was created and it dictated to the last penny exactly how much assistance should be offered to the unemployed. The result was that millions of people in this country were left living on the edge of malnutrition. Government research in the 1930s suggested about a quarter of the British population were living on a subsistence diet with dietary deficiencies common and resultant disorders such as rickets being endemic in some areas. It's in this context we must look at the idea that going off to the instructional centre for three months was a voluntary undertaking. When a man and sometimes his family are on the verge of starvation and wholly dependent on state benefits, then the threat of withdrawing those benefits entirely is a chilling one. The great majority of those offered of saying in inverted commas, the chance of a spell in an instructional centre would probably have declined, all else being equal. This then was one strand of the policy which saw the setting up of the labour camps. Another fear was that after being on the dole for years, many of these men had grown mentally and physically unfit for work. They were soft and flabby and the enforced idleness had sapped their morale leaving them lazy and apathetic. What they needed was rousing and being given a bit of a shock to get them moving again. And they also needed to be prepared psychologically for the idea that they might have to leave where they were currently and move to the other end of the country. They'd have to be shown how to do other kinds of work, the sort of work for which there was a demand. In other words, they'd have to go where the jobs were, rather than hang around on the street corners of the towns in depressed areas, chatting and smoking with their pals. This, then, was the theory behind the camps. The regime in the camps was certainly not cruel or harsh. It was perhaps no tougher than being in the army for a few months. The men slept in corrugated iron Nissen huts, 15 or 20 to a hut. They were issued on arrival at the camp with cutlery, work clothes and bedding and were expected to keep their huts clean and tidy. Many of the instructors working at the camps were themselves ex-soldiers, often sergeant majors, and there was an air of military discipline. The men in some camps were, for instance, marched to and fro in squads and ordered to parade for work in the morning. At night, call, uh, night a roll call was held to ensure that nobody had gone missing. The course of instruction at the camps lasted for three months, which was a long time for men to be separated from their family and friends. One of the things that men who spent their three-month period at the camps remarked was that the work appeared to be undertaken for its own sake, and not really for the purpose of training anybody in anything useful. Stones were quarried and broken into small pieces with sledgehammers so that they could be used for road building, Tree trunks were sawn into sections, tree roots were dug up and land cleared. It was almost as though they were being made to undertake hard physical labour for no other reason than to make them exhausted. 
There may well have been something in this. There was official concern during the Depression that unemployed men were becoming soft and flabby, so making them fit and strong once more, ready to take up labouring jobs, was one of the purposes of sending them to these camps. These days, unemployment and poverty in Britain are often associated with obesity. During the Great Depression, the case was quite different. The main concern was about manual workers who might be undernourished and thin. On arrival at the camps, the men were weighed, and the hope was that with the filling carbohydrate-rich food that was being provided, they had put on weight. Work began at 6am and typically lasted for 10 or 12 hours. The men would be absolutely ravenous after such exertion, and as much food as required could be eaten. How successful was this scheme of social engineering? Did it help move unemployed workers from the special areas into those parts of the country where jobs were more plentiful? In fact, the instructional centres didn't really do much at all. Hundreds of thousands of people moved from the special areas and obtained work elsewhere, but this was almost invariably as a result of personal initiative on the part of those concerned, rather than because of any government scheme. As far as the men who returned from their stint in the labour camp, their prospects remained as dismal as ever. Only 10% of those who had spent their three months in an instructional centre went on to find work. The British experiment with labour camps had not been a success and it was uh, dropped when the First Second World War began. At its height, about 22,000 men a year were being sent to labour camps. It's open to question whether the true aim of sending men to the places was really to help prepare them for working in the field of agriculture. It's not impossible that the system of camps was set up more to galvanise people into action and compel them to make more effort on their own part to find work. They weren't really punitive, but there was a school of thought in London among cabinet ministers and civil servants which held that much of the problem in the depressed part of the country was due to idleness. This unspoken assumption that the unemployed have a tendency to get used to a life on benefits and stop looking for another job is still fairly common today in certain official circles. Every so often some politician will come up with an idea like workfare, where those claiming to be unable to find a job will be made to work publicly in order to earn their benefits. This sort of thing is not meant to be pleasant. It's supposed to serve as a wake-up call. And it's into this category that we should perhaps place the instructional centres of the 1930s.